Hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the Azura Fashion Group Investor Webinar for this offer. I'm so excited to introduce you to Sam and Tim from the Azura team. Welcome guys. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having us. Yeah. I will start off with a bit of an introduction from the boys and if you've got any questions throughout the session, please feel free to add them to the Q&A box and we'll answer them just afterwards. And if you do miss out on anything, just so you know, we will have a follow-up email with a recording as well. So please take it away, guys. Hi, I'm Sam Wood, um, CEO and, and co-founder of Azura Fashion Group. Yeah, and I'm Tim, I'm C COO and co-founder as well. Awesome. If you guys would love to take us through your presentation, we'd love to hear a bit more about the brand and how you've come to be where you are today. Yeah, perfect. So we want to go through today a bit about the company in um, kind of top line to see how the, the company's evolved over the last few years and, and what our new focus is for the business. Um, and we've really been focusing uh, this year and, and, and end of last year on really embracing the circular fashion and the circular economy. So Tim, I'll let you go through the top bit and then I'll, I'll come through the back. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, Azura is, is really a global business that, that brings together fashion, digital and circular, circular economy. Um, and we connect essentially fashion designers and um, wholesalers and boutiques and, and distributors um, to marketplaces around the world in 17 countries and 55 marketplaces reaching around 100 million customers. We basically, how the, the company in, in essence um, allows we, us to connect to uh, like a boutique in Bondi um, that has excess stock or off-season stock and allows us to connect them into uh, customers in, in France or Italy, um, into retailers worldwide. Uh, and it really allows them to be able to move um, from their, their off-season products, their past-season products, but also their second-hand products as well. So it gives them an opportunity to kind of have no wastages, but also keep their brand and pricing intact without having to discount because they can go into new markets where they might not already be. Uh, these are some of the brands we also work with on a global level. So the likes of Gucci, Fendi, Balenciaga, And in terms of, of and how we've started, um, the company was founded in April 2019 and we started selling luxury fashion across AU marketplaces. So the four Australian big, four big Australian marketplaces being Catch, eBay, uh, Kogan, and I believe it was MySale at the time. Um, and we basically built a technology platform that it aggregated all of their products from all over the world and allow it to funnel it, funnel it through into one feed across marketplaces where we looked after kind of the shipping, the marketing, and also all of the sales. We then come to 2020, um, where we enabled uh, luxury brands to then connect to more marketplaces. So we, we pushed into the New Zealand, uh, Southeast Asia, the US and the UK. So based off the success we found with, with the Australian marketplaces, we were quickly able to replicate that and push it out to global marketplaces around the world. We then partnered with major shipping companies to, to drive um, better pricing, better growth, um, but also look at different ways how we can be more sustainable by using kind of DHL's new green, green shipping method. So basically means that everything that we do is all carbon copied. Then we, we basically decided to continue with the investment into technology. So it allowed us to get into products faster um, and upload feeds a lot faster throughout the network, um, which allowed to get real time tracking, which we'll go through in the next slide. Tim, do you want to take the next one? Yeah. You press next. Basically, we're, you know, we, we are enabling the circular economy. And the reality is that every second, the equivalent of one garbage truck of textiles is landfilled or burned globally. And that's, that's just, you know, an incredible statistic. And, you know, if we um, can help reduce that in even a small 
percentage, we'll be, doing, we'll be adding a, a great deal of sustainability to the industry. And the resale platforms that we, we um, the, the, the marketplaces that we're on, um, there is a problem with uh, returns for most of the um, most of the brands and suppliers, and that's where we enable all our returns to come back and become resold as pre-loved, and keeping them um, out of the the landfill. Which which leads us back to uh, 2021 when this became a big focus for us. Um, we basically found that more and more of our customers were becoming millennials and they were more interested in the, the, uh, the ecosystem of, of where these products were coming from, the brands. Um, so we looked at uh, sourcing pre-loved fashion. So we would go after uh, secondhand uh, Gucci or secondhand Chanel handbags that were one of a kind pieces that had a bit of a story behind it. And that's where 2021 really we saw, uh, we doubled our revenue um, almost straight away by opening this new category out. Um, and then from there, launching into 2022, um, we basically looked at well, how way, ways we could basically partner with these marketplaces on a more effective level. So we've basically put together uh, contracts with Farfetch, the iconic Vestiaire Collective, which is the largest pre-loved marketplace in the world, and Poshmark, which is a huge US uh, B2B, sorry, a business to consumer um, fashion retailer. From just, there. just on that uh, warehousing network, I think that's a key um, part of uh, the development during that time is um, ensuring a global logistics network that enables those returns. And so we can turn almost every anything into a, a pre-loved and reuse and resale. And from, and from 2022, when we've really seen um, obviously the channel for, or the, the change and shift for pre-loved fashion, we've really seen where the, the increase in focus of the circular economy is becoming more and more prevalent. So we are now starting to uh, resell all of our returns as pre-loved and actually rent out our slow moving returns as well. So it gives us, besides giving us two new income streams, it also keeps those products out of landfill. So we now have a full 360 version of our product. So when we buy a product from a boutique, we, we look after it from, from cradle to grave. So the products will go out to the customer, be returned to us. We will then classify it as re, re, uh, pre-loved and then relist it across all the marketplaces globally, even if they're just the pre-loved marketplaces or we rent out those products. So how Azura came to play? Um, in 2018, uh, Burberry destroyed more than $50 million worth of stock. Um, and it wasn't the only brand that did it, it was just one of the ones in the papers. But Nike was also there, Louis Vuitton, um, where basically they looked at, at ways of preserving the exclusivity. Um, but in reality, fast fashion and shorter fashion cycles are built into the DNA of the stock. So we found that um, more and more brands were, were going to adopting this new this method um, until it was 2018 when it was released that um, obviously the consumers were quite upset about it, but brands still didn't have a way of offloading this stock. So we built Azura Runway as a, as a portal or a partnership to partner with these brands to give them an alternative way of, of selling their off-season products or past-season products without heavily discounting them by reaching new markets and by also pushing them out as pre-loved. So the circular fashion market is growing every single year. And last year in the US was being the biggest year that they've ever had um, with one in three consumers caring more about what they're wearing than the sustainable apparel than more than the pandemic ever did. So the second-hand market is projected to be worth 77 billion in five years, with the pre-loved fashion expected to grow 11 times faster than the broader retail sector. Fast fashion is meant to plateau by 2025, with pre-loved fashion kind of really taking off. Basically, brands are trying to get make, make thrift shopping um, cool again, really. So by going down the whole circular fashion model, by being sustainable, it allows brands to connect more with their customers. And we're finding more and more the millennials coming into the market, that their, their, their choice of, of who they purchase from is more around what the brand does in terms of their social imprint 
rather than the marketing they're pushing out there. Tim, I'll let you go for this one. Yeah. Um, essentially, you know, the, we, uh, the, the customers are on the marketplaces around the world. And, it, you know, and it, it's very enticing for a customer because you get all the big brands in one place. And um, for, for uh, as, as I was talking about before, for the, for the suppliers, it's, a, it's often quite difficult to get on all of these um, marketplaces around the world at once. And, and that's because the data behind it and each of the marketplaces has different listing requirements, data requirements, and what do you do with the returns? And, that, and that's what we solve. So we list all, their pre all the um, end of line off season products um, we ensure that they're all global marketplace data ready and we list it and then we handle the returns. We, we, when they come into one of our um, uh, warehouses, we're Netherlands, the US, the UK, Italy and Australia. Um, when they come in there, they are um, quality assured, uh, ensured that they're, they're, they're in a good condition to be resold. They're marked as pre-loved and relisted so it just keeps on going around the circle and um you know that in that way the the, the returns have always been the pain point for um, most e-commerce businesses and it's actually turned um the the biggest pain point into one of our biggest benefits and it's driving additional revenue through the the pre-loved um returns as pre-loved and as well it's reducing wastage and landfill And this, uh, as I mentioned, it was um, that we do have um, products coming from suppliers all around the world, and they all give data and provide data in different ways. Um, we every image that is is sent into our system is scanned, and um, the AI technology just it recognizes and, and, and creates the the listing um, attributes that allow us to list um, that product on any uh, marketplace globally. And it's, it, um, and, uh, it also, um, we change the sizing because UK size and different US sizing, different to Italian sizing. And so we, we have to, we bring everything together and the system automatically does it into an international standard and provides it in a, in a way that anybody from virtually any country can buy that product on any marketplace. Yeah, so, so we basically um, have gone through the different groundworks of how we went to market. And each marketplace we went to required a different set of attributes, which you can see on the right hand side here. Um, and a lot of the, the brands or boutiques that we're working with, um, especially the wholesalers, didn't have anywhere near that kind of data. And we basically discovered or we built a tool that enabled all of that data to be done through AI technology, which basically scanned the image and pulled those data points out of the actual image. So now we can go to a boutique with very, very limited data, like the one on the left, um, pull in their feed, and within 48 hours, all of their images have been scanned. We, we now have a correct collection of attributes that are marketplace ready, and we can now list those products anywhere on any marketplace in the world within 40, 48 hours that we're already connected to. So it gives us the, the real global reach, but also it allows us to scale almost instantly. So the financial growth, again, this shows how the business has grown and where the, where the kind of growth has come from. So when we first started um, local and built platforms, so that's when, when we launched Azura Runway, um, and that was our B2C kind of model was just to kind of take on board the, um, the, the fashion brands and to get brands on board. Um, we then launched that into the likes of the eBay and the Australian marketplaces. From there, we grew, we grew into the, the global marketplaces, the US and the UK. Um, and then from 2021 is when we launched the pre-love. So you can see the, the, the impact pre-love has done for us. Um, and from there to 2022 and 23, um, we're still scaling the pre-love fashion, but also we're, we're really building out this whole circular economy.
So you can tell, really tell pre-loved or, or the circular fashion is, is part of our DNA now, and it's really gonna be the real driving factors for, for the business going forward. So in terms of funds, where, where they will, will go after this, this round, um, regional sales in the US, Europe, Australia, and Asia. So this is to acquire new markets, sorry, new boutiques. So to get the best products, to get the best uh, pre-loved fashion. Um, and then it goes to sales support to help support with the marketplaces. As we mentioned before, we, we're currently selling across 55 retailers and marketplaces worldwide. Um, that number now with the technologies built will grow to 100 within the next six to 12 months. So that will continue to really, really build. Um, and on different platforms. Our go-to-market our new products, so having a rental opportunity so we can rent out our pre-loved fashion um, to pull that out so we can actually have another source of income but also make sure these products are being reused. We're also launching a buyback system which allows customers to buy from our platforms and have the opportunity to, to then buy that, to sell that product back to us. So a customer would come to us buy a Louis Vuitton handbag and then have the opportunity to when they at the checkout to say, sell this back to Azura in say six months or, or, or maybe sell it back to us. So then when they log in in six months time, they can then click a button and it relists the product back to us. So then we, we can buy the product back from the customer. So making sure that product isn't gonna be thrown away or get rid of, but it also gives us um, and more products to kind of resell into the market. So it keeps the customers happy with us um, and, and it also keeps, um, basically gives us more products to kind of relist and resell across Vestiaire or, or other pre-loved marketplaces. And what we're looking to do um, as the business grows is to offer that buyback system to partners like the Iconic um, and like Farfetch, where we can actually go after their customers and enable uh, a greater reach of Azura, but also becoming Azura becomes more sticky and more um, connected to these marketplaces on a global level. The technology integrations, um, onboarding the marketplaces. We've built a platform now that enables us to kind of link uh, almost systematically so we can really drive new marketplaces uh, faster. So our last, when we, where you, when we first started this, it just take us six months to connect to a marketplace from when we signed the contract to when we had listings live. We can now do it within 48 hours. So it's really about keeping those systems in place and really building upon those systems to acquire more marketplaces. And I guess the, the main focus as well is, is for Azura, we not only want to be a, a circular brand or a circular fashion company, um, we want to enable other brands and other boutiques to become circular too. So by going after or, or approaching brands or designers um, in Australia and, and around the world um, that have returns or have a, have, a, have a wastage level, we can now plug into them and say, we'll look after all your returns, we'll rent them out, and we'll also list them on, on pre-love marketplaces. So we actually enable other brands and other boutiques to become circular. And that's really the core focus of what we're trying to become. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. If anybody has any questions, please pop them in the Q&A box and we can start answering them. So in terms of how the market has reacted to your product, what have been the key feedbacks that you have received so far? Sorry, I was just exiting the screen. Can you answer again, sorry? So in terms of the market reaction to your product, what feedback have you received so far from the clients that you have in play? So from, from the brands, um, so the biggest impact for them was well, allowing them to kind of off, to, to sell their off-season products. Um, I guess how the business first started was, was allowing brands to, to sell all their excess stock um, so for the brand side of things, we've had a really good um, uptick, um, as you can imagine, and it's allowed a lot of small boutiques to actually move stock on their floor um, that, we, that they could normally not move. Like during COVID, we helped a boutique in Bondi actually move their whole floor stock when they, when they stopped getting foot traffic. So it really helped with them. We became instrumental in kind of 
saving their business, as they put it, um, because they had a, all of a sudden had a sales channel that they could push out all their products to without having to spend any money on marketing and without having any foot traffic. So we enabled that um, from that side. And then on the, on the retailer's side, um, it really comes down to we're almost a one-stop shop for them where we can bring them um, the world's biggest brands um, as well as the world's um, some of the biggest uh, pre-love fashion as well. So it enables um, kind of win-win for both scenarios because we become that um, partner to these bigger brands because we our products range from about 150 to 380,000 products at any one time. Um, and it really, when we go to marketplaces, we go with such a large catalogue, we, we get the referential treatment there so we can also move uh, boutiques that would normally go to one of these marketplaces and sit in the queue. So we kind of really help from both angles there. Yeah, fantastic. What processes do you have in place for cleaning return products for resale? So we go through a uh, quality assurance process. So once a product comes back into our system, um, it goes through a quality assurance check with a few different sites online, one being realauthentication.com, um, where the product will be uh, scaled and also go through a different um, uh, goes through different quality checks. So for instance, the stitching or go through the the um, the logo and the serial number goes through that process. And then from that process on, it then goes through a cleaning process. So whether it goes to a dry cleaner or it goes to a, um, all the warehouse staff in, in, in that warehouse are set up to, to clean the product itself. But usually if it goes to the rental program or, or the pre-loved, it will go through the dry cleaner. Awesome. Where did the name Azura come from? So Azura means confident. Um, and I guess when we first started the business, we wanted the people to be confident in their own skin and confident with what they wear and confident with the service um, that the product is going to be authentic, authentic and it's going to arrive to them on time. Awesome. Do you see any issues that may arise surrounding IP or defensibility of your product? No, I, th I, I, I don't believe so um, because this has taken three, four years to really build. Um, and we are kind of hitting it at almost so many different angles. Um, the fact that we haven't come into a competitor yet, um, I guess it is good news, um, but it's the relationships that we build is what's probably key more than the technology itself. Um, and having these relationships with all these brands and, and marketplaces is really the one thing that um, we can say that that it is probably the, the foundation of our business. Um, of course, there can be people coming in and, and, and replicating what we do, um, but it's really how we continue to evolve and, and like the pre-loved conversational circular fashion. It's how we really can evolve the company and the partnerships that we have um, that we can really drive that. Okay, awesome. So obviously you're doing a raise. What are the key areas that you're going to focus the money on once the raise is complete? So the key areas we're focusing the money on, I'll just uh, we'll basically go through um, the driving of the sales. So bringing on more boutiques. So acquiring more boutiques to come on board, um, building out the onboarding process for those boutiques as well as the marketplaces. So being able to say, all right, we want to be on um, 50 marketplaces in the next six months. Um, it's going out to them and, and, and going through that process. Um, but it's also redefining the way that we, we do things. So going through kind of the buyback system and the rental system and building the logistics and the operations around that. So being able to, and also being able to go to brands now and say, we, we've done this for ourselves and now we want to do it for you. So going to the boutiques in Australia and the, the brands in Australia and say, all your returns that are coming back to warehouses and sitting there or, or, or going nowhere, we'll look after and we can help you, one, get another source of income from it, but two, also get it back out into the circular economy. Awesome. I, I think another key area in that um, sense is the increased automation. And um, you know, stopping the reliance on on staff and and uh, human um, interaction. So when an order is placed, it gets automatically sent through to the supplier, and when it gets shipped out, the tracking gets automatically sent back to our system, which uh, um, uploads into the marketplace, which gets it to the customer, and all that all that happens instantly 
for thousands of orders every day. And that and that and ensuring that is is automated and absolutely error free because there's no human interaction in there is is critical, I think, is to allow us to scale. Because if we if we're doing thousands, thousands of orders a day, then um, it, that is time consuming for a human interaction. And we're we're um, largely automated at the moment, but but um, as we move forward and depending on the, the marketplace requirements. Um, that is a technical um, development that needs to be done. Fantastic. Can you indicate how you see the investor model operating moving forward? In what way? Uh, so that was asked by Theodora. Theodora, if you could give a little bit more insight into um, what you mean by this question, that would be fantastic. So in the meantime as well, why are you doing crowd fundraising as opposed to a traditional method of fundraising? So what we're, why we're doing crowdfunding is um, as we're trying to build this whole circular economy and, and circular um, story, the best way um, we can think of to kind of build that out is by having um, our investors be our number one fan and really going out there and, and spreading the message of, of what the company does. Um, because we're not just a, a B, we're not a, a business to consumer model and we're not a business to business model, we're kind of a hybrid. It enables our business to be kind of something to everyone. Um, and by having um, all the, the crowdfunding people on board or the investors on board, it enables them to also be able to spread our message out and kind of be our, our loyal fans, but also our customers. And it enables people to get involved in business. Like, what I would love to be is 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 in five ten years when the, when the company is at a different level is is have all our investors come through the journey with us from from day one. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer for sure. And also in terms of how you compare with other competitors in the space, do you have other competitors, or are you more of a lone wolf? We have competitors in Australia that do different uh, verticals. So there are the likes of, of New Aim that do kind of tech, uh, do furniture and we have a KG Electronics who do kind of the electronic side. So we haven't come across many companies that do exactly the same thing as we do. Um, the, closest, the closest competitor would be Netaporter itself. Um, whilst Netaporter is a competitor, it's also a partner. So we've partnered with the likes of Farfetch and Netaporter to one, build our, build our authenticity with those brands, um, but also to kind of take away any kind of um, competitive shove back or anything like that. So they, they're good and they're strong in some markets where we're strong in others. So it enables us to partner with our competitors as well as um, kind of compete with them in certain areas. Awesome. And how often will you be communicating with investors going forward? We normally can, uh, would talk to our investors every three months um, as, as all those news arises. Um, as you can see, our company grows is growing at a quite alarming rate. So we, we are um, basically going through new hurdles and, and I, 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 for one, love to share the news. So I, I reach out on my own LinkedIn quite regularly. Um, but yeah, we, we do share with our current investors quite regularly. Awesome. What do the next 12 months look like for Azura? So the next 12 months will be um, basically shoring down the technology, um, but also really locking in the exclusive partnerships. So the, the partnership with, with Vestia Collective and with Farfetch, that's going to be one that we're going to really push out. Um, the, the partnership with, with the Iconic, um, I can't say too much about that yet, but that is coming live in the next month or two which that will be a Australia-wide initiative um, where we'd be launching exclusively to, to the Iconic. So um, look out for that one. Um, and there is a lot more other initiatives coming up into play, but it's really about cementing our relationships and exclusivity with the bigger players of town. So it's um, partnering with the likes of Poshmark in the US, who is one of the leading fashion retailers in, in, Australia, in the US. So it's really building those partnerships out and also increasing revenue. Um, so we're expecting revenue to continue to climb, the climb at the rate it's going, if not more. Yeah, terrific. Uh, in terms of investor rewards for this offer, are you going to be providing those? 
We will be, yes. Um, and that will be released uh, shortly after our, our offer document is released next week when, when we go live. So we'll definitely be releasing investor rewards. And as I said, we want our investors to be our number one fans, but also our customers. So we'll definitely be releasing um, incentives for, for getting on board. Yeah, brilliant. I've just had uh, Maylene jump on a little bit later. We'll absolutely be sending through the link after the panel discussion. So we'll send that through and you can rewatch it a bit later. Uh, in terms of expanding the business and its features, what inspires you to do those? I guess it comes down to Tim's point is the automation is to take away a lot of the, um, the human error out, out of the process, but allow us to be, to scale, I guess, when we're, when we're dealing with 55 marketplaces and, and 20 plus suppliers, there's a lot of moving parts um, and stock updates are coming through every 15 minutes. So it's really pushing through those, those processes where we can build an automation platform, um, where we can actually really um, have it at scale and continue to drive knowing that it's being looked after. When, when Tim and I first started this, it was us sitting on weekends at 12 o'clock at night, placing orders and updating tracking numbers for every single marketplace around the world. So it's really been born out of desperation, I guess, in terms of getting our lives back, but also being able to scale the company to a, to a, to a global level. Mm. And with the, the pre-loved, um, there's a quantity of one in the world. So once it sells on one marketplace, if you're on a whole lot of marketplaces, once it sells, it's got to be pulled off every other marketplace within 15 minutes so it doesn't sell twice. So the, the, as, we, as we increase our um, focus onto the pre-love sector, um, the, the technology that sits behind it um, becomes increasingly important. Awesome. And how big is your team currently and are you looking to expand your team? Our team is 12 people at the moment. Um, and that's spread across Australia and the Philippines. Our, opera, our, our customer service team in, is in the operate, sorry, is in the Philippines, as well as our logistics team. Um, and the rest of our team is here in Australia. Um, we will be extending our team um, into more the, the into the sales and account managing um, to kind of bring on new um, boutiques and, and marketplaces. Yeah, fantastic. All right, and if we don't have any more questions from our attendees today, I might bring it to a close, just in case anybody has missed anything, we will be sending it out this afternoon, as I have mentioned, and the offer will be going live very, very soon, but we'll be communicating that with you in the coming days, so you know when to look out for it and when we will be going live. So thank you so much for that. And of course, if you've got any questions at all, you can reach out to the team Azura. You can go on their virtual profile, have a little chat with them and just get in touch regarding anything. The boys will be in touch with all of you as well. So anything that you need, they're always there. Thanks a lot, guys, for coming. Really appreciate your time. All right, thanks for having us. Thank you. All right, have a great day, everybody.